welcome to the Ghosts of Harren Hall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for a very special edition of the podcast. Today we'll be interviewing Dr. Tammy Milkey, Senior Lecturer in the Honors College at Northern Arizona University. Dr. Milkey teaches a class on the Game of Thrones and reached out to us about some of the issues that we had been talking about, specifically the walls of King's Landing and whether Arya was inside them or outside them at various points. And we really enjoyed our back and forth with her, so we invited her to have a chat with us. On with the show. Today we're joined by uh, Dr. Tammy Milkey from Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. Uh, welcome. Hi, guys. Hi. And, and her dog, Sochi. <laughs> that, that sounded really formal it's as if we'd never talked before but we've actually just been chatting for the last 20 minutes and uh, she's a very nice lady and we're very happy to have her with us so um uh tammy why don't you can i call you tammy or do you want do yes you want no bit? that's totally fine totally fine um why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh why you're why you're with us today well uh i found you guys' podcast uh uh, I guess about August of 2020, uh, partly because I was looking for podcasts to use to supplement my teaching. Um, I kind of use podcasts. I don't have students necessarily listen to the podcast, but I feel like I'm more in tune with the information because I've listened to you guys have your discussions about it. And I'm like, but but, but, uh, <laughs> so it, it gives me a starting point sometimes to really think about different, um, arguments, different concepts, things that I hadn't thought of just on my own. So you guys are kind of my background academic conversation that I have before I actually have those conversations with my students. Cool. So, uh, I loved how you set up the podcast in terms of, uh, reviewing where the character was previously and then going forward and sort of saying and this is where the character is now doing your summaries and then and then getting into the topics that you guys want to talk about um and so i think it was uh, one of your chapters on aria <laughs> i was not satisfied with just pointing at my speaker going but guys you forgot or <laughs> whatever <laughs> and so wrote to you guys about uh going to visit Dubrovnik and looking at the city walls and you guys emailed back and suddenly here we are. Here we are. So, so, so remind me about that conversation. So what, what did we talk about? What, what did we say that got you to reach out to us? We, we were talking about the fact that Arya seemed to be trapped in King's Landing, but at some points outside the walls. Yeah, Down by the river. Uh, she, she was getting to the river and we couldn't figure out how she was getting to the river because there looks to, looks to be a wall that goes around the city on the riverside. Right, and so I was pointing out um, that medieval cities in general have outer city walls and then the inner keep walls. And I think that's where the confusion was taking place. That's not Simon's stomach. That's uh, Tammy's <laughs> that would be dog. My dog. So apologies, <laughs> apologies. Um, everyone is coming home in the neighborhood right now, so she <laughs> she wants to she wants to be on the podcast too. Uh, so uh, yeah, so we were talking about the the city walls, and um, I actually went to Dubrovnik. I guess it was about four summers ago, and they have a whole Game of Thrones tour. You guys would absolutely love. You get to go on the boat. It it's amazing. Now but Dubrovnik also, is where they film uh, King's Landing scenes. Correct? Yeah, the King's Landing scenes, um, and it's amazing because you can walk around the city and you can stand on the steps where an event happens that we can't talk about yet because it's not in book one. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. I don't have to Stopped edit myself out, so. there. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's a beautiful city to see. And it's got an amazing history of being an independent city for like 700 years. I mean, it's it, rich history, real history, not only Game of Thrones history. Right. Uh, but anyway, you can see those inner and outer walls. Right. And you see that they have little places. Uh, for example, there's a bar that's outside the city walls right on the water. And you literally have to like crawl through this hole in order to get to this totally functioning bar that's outside the city walls. Okay. Yeah. So there are literally holes in the wall yeah. that you can get. I, I thought that that might be the case. And when Which, you sent your email, you, you suggested we go look at pictures and maps of Dubrovnik. And so I did. And I, I picked up on that's what you were getting at based on the uh, the pictures that I saw. Yeah. And if you think about it, you know, 
one person getting into the city wall or a couple of people isn't the danger that an entire army is. And so you want to make sure that your citizens have access, but at the same time that the walls do what walls are supposed to do, right? Right, right. So you teach a class on Game of Thrones. I do. Um, It's called Game of Thrones and Politics. And I, I we're not going to get totally political. Uh, really, the way that I set up this class and the way that I set up all of my classes is I like to take things that are pop culture, lowbrow, if you want to call them that, um, <laughs> and, and look at the ways in which these materials reflect our daily world around us. And so Game of Thrones is really useful in talking about power and hierarchies and how power and hierarchy works in our society, um, whether it's our own families Uh, whether it's the jobs that we're in, whether it's uh, the state government, the federal government, et cetera. And so what we do in this class is really talk about the different types of power that exists and how you can manipulate power. So we we get into a little bit of game theory and talk about when you have um, players who are not honest and how that changes the game. So we get into, you know, what is Cersei doing? What is, you know, Joffrey doing? Uh, We talk about how, you know, Ned kind of in book one really misuses his power. He has so many opportunities. Yeah, you guys bring it up a number of times, (laughs) but so many opportunities where he could have cleared out the small council, got his own people in positions and really protected himself. But because he is honorable, he played according to his ethics instead of playing the game to win. Right. Um, so he plays by the rules. So, so we talk about that. And what the students have to do throughout the semester is we use the, the past two, the 2016 and the 2020 presidential elections. Uh, we look at how uh, winnowing happens with the candidates that we go from many candidates Um, In 2016, many Republicans, in 2020, many Democrats, how that gets boiled down to two candidates, and then what power moves they make in order to secure the vote. And so then the students, their semester long project is to find this power and hierarchy in their own lives. And so a couple of semesters ago, I had a student whose family sort of had mob ties and oh, so wow. she did. <laughs> she had to get permission from the Godfather to use her family as an example. Um, I've had a student who did marching band and the politics between, you know, the percussion and the woodwinds and, you know, how the Starks conductor the keeps it all. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so we really have a lot of fun. Uh, I had one who did uh, skiing versus snowboarders. And sort of the conflicts between them and so it's fun because they play with it a little bit and decide you know who is who is the ethical party uh oh this semester i had a student who did her parents divorce oh okay. and she is um above the age of 18 but she has a sister who's under the age of 18 and so she could kind of be removed from the situation because she was away at college and uh, yeah, so the, the students find some really interesting ways. And the idea is that if we understand how power works in our whole, own lives, we can then um, manipulate is, is a bad word, but we can find ways to use power to make the game turn out in our favor. Okay. Sounds amazing. That Sounds is, that's, really that's fantastic. Do you get a lot of, um, so I really don't understand American universities, so bear with me. <laughs> do, you, do you get a, a lot of signups from non-English majors? So I am in the honors college. And so the majority of our students actually are biomed. Oh. Um, and wow. honors is sort of the, the way that they can still have some humanities in their lives. Oh, nice. um, Although we, we have all sorts of honors courses in the honors college, it's a college of itself. They have a certain number of credits that they have to attain that are honors credits. And so my class actually serves as one of the liberal studies basic um, elements that everybody has to get, but only honor students are allowed in my classes. Interesting. Okay. That answers some of the questions I had lined up actually, because you, I mean, it's, you don't have to be an aficionado of Game of Thrones to appreciate your class, it would feel like. I mean, there's parallels there, but really the class is more about real life. 
and how Game of Thrones sort of is a, a an allegory for lots of things that people could point to today. Yeah, we really look at um, how power functions um, and how power functions as a character itself, but also as a tool that is used by the characters. Um, but the same thing happens in the world around us. Uh, I, I use a show from Showtime called The Circus, and they follow the candidates around. And it's a, it's a half an hour show that's on Sunday nights. Um, and it has one guy whose name I'm blanking right now, sorry. <laughs> uh, he was a Republican strategist and the other three are um, very democratic in their leanings. And so it balances. And what they do is they would follow all of the political candidates. I mean, they're in Iowa, they're in New Hampshire. They follow them around. And because these guys are insiders, they're able to like sit down and have dinner with Bernie Sanders and have these conversations about, you know, how are, how are their campaigns going and what's working and what's not working and they are behind the scenes. And so it's a really interesting view of how in the real world, power is being used as a tool by these characters, much like in Game of Thrones. So it's this idea of fiction always tells us something about who we are in real life. And so we get those comparisons going and it's really fun to sort of play games of like, well, who do you think is, uh, you know, such and such character from Game of Thrones uh -huh. and what are the parallels and how are they different? How are they functioning in different realms? And yeah, we get into like the houses and the battles and even geography plays a huge part in how power functions. Uh -huh. Do you find that most of the students are really big A Song of Ice and Fire Game of Thrones fans? Is, is it a prerequisite of the class to have read at least a Game of Thrones ahead of time or do you So we, we, yeah, we read book one and what we do is uh, I use the HBO series. And so we read the chapters that correspond with that particular episode. So they get to see how HBO tweaks a little bit. And of course in book one, that doesn't happen a whole lot. Right, yeah, it's pretty close. Um, but <laughs> it's been kind of interesting. So I just finished teaching this course for the third time. The first two times, almost every student, and this, this is a class of 20 students, generally. I think I had maybe one or two the first time I taught it and one or two the second time who had never read or seen, you know, they were totally clueless. You know, they'd like, oh, I heard of this thing before. This past fall, I had one person who had read the series. Wow. The others had not heard of it at all. <laughs> so I, I think that was another thing that kind of pulled me into your podcast because, you know, you guys work really hard not to give away spoilers. And I was now faced with, you know, having this entire curriculum set up that has spoilers all over the place. <laughs> and I finally just had to say to the students, guys, there's going to be spoilers and you know what? It's kind of been out for a while, right. so I, I, I can't guarantee you that there's not going to be spoilers. Statute of limitation is up on exactly. Uh, the spoilers. <laughs> exactly. But I found that the, the class this fall um, got into the series in different ways than classes that were already familiar. I could see. Um, and yeah, I, yeah. I should back up and say I was teaching the class when the HBO series ended. Right. And so we actually had class, I think, on Thursday nights, but we would all meet on campus on Sunday nights to watch Game of Thrones together. Uh, yell at the <laughs> TV. <it> was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it was always kind of fun. We, we had a Deadpool going for who was going to die in the last season <laughs> and, <laughs> and all that sort of stuff and who was, who was going to, you know, end up in charge and all of that. So um, every time I teach the class, it's a little bit different. Sure. I get a different mix of students. And that, you know, that's part of the, the challenge and the fun. Right. Just to sort of make this relevant for them. So did you actually enjoy the books or is your interest purely academic? I did enjoy the books. I, I started by watching season one on HBO. Um, got to the last episode in season one and went, what the heck is this author doing? I need to read these books. <laughs> And I did, and then I, I read all of them that were out. Right. <laughs> Come on, Martin, start writing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I always tell my students, I, and, I, and I won't give any spoilers away, but at the end of book five, I did throw book five across the room. <laughs> I was like, Martin, I get it, okay? We, we, know, we know the tricks you play. We still don't like them, but yeah. 
yeah. So I, I do enjoy reading them. Although I will say, I think it was three and four. Is three and four the books that were actually split into two? I think they might've been. He introduces a lot of characters that have like nothing to do with anything. Yeah, right. And HBO, I think did a good job of sort of weaving weeding those right. characters out they, they kept the storylines um, trim and tight yeah as far as yeah. you could get as trim yeah. as you could get with the game of thrones but exactly exactly so so you're not really teaching sort of you're not really teaching how to sort of dissect a book here really you, you're, you're you're teaching something else the book is just the backdrop to what you're trying to teach really yeah um you know one of the weekly assignments that my students have to do is they have to um, they have to have written responses, and at the end of those written responses, they ask discussion questions, and that's how I get them thinking about the text itself. And we do, you know, we spend a lot of time. Uh, the first two weeks, we spend talking about the War of the Roses. We get into the like the real history um, and how Martin is using. Um, all of this British history. So, and again, we sort of compare characters between real life history and what Martin has written. Sure. Um, but yeah, you know, my students are honor students. And with that sort of comes usually the ability, most of them have already had AP English. This is a class that they take either their sophomore, junior, or senior year. Um, and so, yeah, the expectation is that they understand how to analyze literature. So we don't do a lot of that sort right. of basic stuff. I've been trying to teach McKelly a little bit about the War of the Roses. Yeah. Uh, I'm Lancastrian. And uh, uh -huh. last time I went to England, my old and my team from Lancashire were playing against Bradford from Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. And I took my son to the game and it was a revelation to him that the War of the Roses is not entirely over. Because... <laughs> Anyone who's been to a football match in England knows that those wars are never over. <laughs> the Oldham fans sang a song that was so scurrilous. My, my son is still scarred. <laughs> it... This last week, uh, because there weren't, or there were fans in the stands at the Liverpool game. Yeah. And of course they were singing one of their wonderful songs that uh, maybe has language that's not appropriate for a TV viewing audience. The announcers had to apologize, apologize for yes. words they might have heard. I, I was like, because, because uh, you when, guys when 30,000 are singing it, it's just noise. <laughs> but when 2,000, you can pick it out what they're saying. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Simon and Tammy both got their PhDs in England. So um, yeah. I, I'm i feeling woefully undereducated here with my simple bachelor's degree in journalism at the moment. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I'm, I would like to say something to reassure you, McKelly. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, can, can we talk a little bit about the Maesters? Because this is where my thoughts about the Maesters came. Yes, in. absolutely. So the last episode that I listened to, which I think came out on December 27th, was about John at the Wall and mm -hmm. uh, Master Eamon and the, um, oh my gosh, the rings? What are they? The, the Master's Chain. The, the Master's the Chain. Chains, yeah. The Chains, yeah. Um, and, and Simon, I didn't know that you have a PhD from England, so you will get this. I think the process they go through with the change is very much like a viva that you have in England. So you you write your PhD, you write your thesis, right? So mine's like 468 pages long. You send it out to people who don't know anything about you. And then you meet in a room and they basically ask you questions until they are satisfied that yes, you wrote this and you know what you're talking about. And I really think that that's what happens with the maesters is that their chains are when they have achieved a certain level of knowledge and are able to explain that knowledge to others, boom, they get their chain. Oh, um, right. And I and I, mm, I can't say the rest of that because I don't want to give spoilers away. <laughs> but I, for one character who doesn't stay very long um, in his training, I think he is able to accomplish knowledge faster because of his love of reading and the experiences he's already had. And, and so I think his achieving the, the maester status and getting his, his chains um, happens faster than maybe would happen with most people. 
I had not thought of it like that, but I like the idea that we should we should actually be able to forge chains. That would be nice. Well, and and I was trying to think of it in a in an American context too. That you know, when someone chooses to go to uh, Votech instead of college, right? They it, they are gaining knowledge in ways that are maybe not considered traditional college paths, but are nevertheless very important and very necessary. And that training then is is judged to be completed in ways that are different than what we do in a traditional college setting. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I have to say, I, I liked my the way my PhD was set up because I think that an American style PhD wouldn't have worked as well for me because I, I was so specialized from a very early age. I felt specialized. I wanted to be specialized and I would have hated to have to do things that weren't in my specialty. So mm -hmm. I, I, I really benefited, benefited from it. I can certainly imagine how people wouldn't. And, and the Viva worked particularly well for me because I, the, the external professor who came in, came in from Spain and he wasn't allowed to smoke. In, and he was just desperate to get out of there from the <laughs> 30 minute point. You could see he was like, I just want this to be over. <laughs> One of my experts had to catch a train. <laughs> 42 minute viva. Boom. <laughs> Uh, Michaela, just so you know, sometimes these things can go on for okay. hours yeah. and hours. I, so viva is when you, you have to defend your basically. thesis. Okay. I figured. I believe it's Latin for life. So you're basically, yeah. You're fighting for your life. You're fighting for your life. <laughs> one, one story I'll give you. So my, my PhD was on um, computer simulation of liquid crystal phases. And uh, one of the requisites was sort of like at the midpoint, you had to give a presentation to the whole department mm -hmm. and sort of talk about what you've done to this point and what you were planning to do for the rest of the time. And I had this wooden model that I borrowed from a different professor, not my own professor, which was basically a flat plate and then a wooden spike. And then there were wooden slats that the spike went through. And each of these wooden slats had a little um, knobble on it. And so basically if you twisted them, they would form a spiral. It was, like, it was probably like four feet high. And this, is a, this was a model of a liquid crystal. And this is how liquid crystals sort of block light because of this spiral formation that they form. And I had it behind the desk as I was giving my presentation. And I, I was gonna sort of culminate by pulling this out and showing them what the liquid crystals we were gonna do. And I grabbed it by the top of the spike and I pulled it and it came out of the base and they all went. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so like the culmination of my that? presentation, <laughs> just picking up like a hundred pieces of wood and dumping it on the table. <laughs> well, I, it, I don't, I don't know if this is how yours went, but you know, they, you, they bring you into this room. You have these conversations. They ask you questions. You know, why did you write this? Why did you do this? And then they're like, okay, well, you can leave the room now. And then they talk about you, you know, <laughs> and then you come back in and, and the thing is, is if the champagne bottle is open, then you're golden, <laughs> then you're okay, everything went well. So it's like the first thing everyone says, like, look for the champagne bottle. <laughs> it... So uh, yeah, I walk in, champagne bottles open. So what was your and, thesis? Uh, my thesis is actually in um, children's and adolescent literature. So the title of my dissertation is are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. Literary constructs of African American childhood in the 1930s in American children's literature. Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because your the title of your thesis has to be original. No one else can have a thesis, and your PhD is actually in the title of your thesis. So again, totally different system than the American system. Uh, I, you know, we, we toasted, they said, congratulations, Dr. Milky, da, 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 you know, and, uh, they said, oh, we were so impressed. You didn't seem nervous at all. And I said the whole time my hands were under the table and I was just rubbing my palms <laughs> on my pants so that they wouldn't sweat. And I'm like, yes, I'll answer all of your questions. I know exactly. <laughs> so yeah, always fun stories. No, but you, you don't just teach, you also write papers. You, you've written many interesting papers, I believe. I do. Um, and this is, this is where, for what I do in honors, which is a lot of uh, creative courses that I get to make up and teach. So yeah, and, uh, next semester I have 
two classes on Harry Potter and the Muggle World. Uh, um, cool. I teach a course on fact and fiction time travel. Um, <laughs> and then my fourth course is First Ladies, Their Causes and Effects. Okay. And so cool uh, my dissertation, yeah, my dissertation really sort of set up the way that I approach most things, which again is to look at sort of the historical record or the fiction and compare it to what's happening in today's world. And, and how do we take these artifacts of literature or media, um, how do we take them and make them relevant and learn lessons really so that we can make our world a better place? And I've totally forgotten what the original question was, I'm sorry. No, I was just asking you about some of the papers. Oh, you know, oh just um, your, your yeah, classes. so honestly, literally just today, a couple hours ago, um, I co-authored a paper on Iron Man and masculinity and looked at the development of Tony Stark's masculinity in and out of the suit through the um, MCU films. So that was really fun. That's coming out in a book about Marvel. Oh, wow. uh, I've also written and theorized steampunk as a genre, which gets <laughs> into sort of uh, Victorian ideologies and nostalgia and how we blend those things. Um, I've done a little bit of work in how accents um, and dialect is used in early African-American children's literature. Um, and right now I'm actually co-editing a collection on uh, Mildred Taylor, who is the first African-American author to win the Newbery which is the award for the best children's book. Um, and she won that in 1976. And no one's really done any critical work on her Logan family series. And so uh, there'll be a collection coming out from University of Mississippi Press is who we have the contract with. So hopefully by the end of next year, it was supposed to be the end of this year, but let me tell you, COVID did a thing on academics. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm... Publications? Who's got time for that? We're just trying to survive. <laughs> yep. I had a college sophomore in my house this past spring, and 20-year-olds uh, are not supposed to live at home. I could tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason why they're supposed to be off at school. <laughs> so, so because I was so specialized, I have never got to talk to a professor of literature about literature. So I might ask questions that you, you would expect of your freshman and so please, <laughs> please, please forgive. <laughs> one of the things, one of the things I was going to ask you was, do you, do you like that people like JK Rowling and George Martin are so uber successful when perhaps literary people who perhaps you have more respect for as writers aren't as successful because I mean, like, you can't be as successful as J.K. Rowling. I mean, she, she's out there on her own, but I'm sure in your opinion, there were better writers than her. Yeah, but, and, and this is where, maybe because I come from the field of children's literature um, and we're kind of a smaller academic field anyway, that oftentimes people are like, really? You have a job reading children's <laughs> books? <laughs> Yeah, let me tell you, <laughs> because they say things about who we are as a society and what we think our children should be, sure. and therefore how we think the future will look or how we want it to look. Um, and so I have never been in a position where I'm like, oh, the classics, right? <laughs> uh, because, because the classics to me are like Roald Dahl, you know, right. uh, yeah. one of my favorite authors um, who is loved and hated in my field for many different reasons. Um, some of the things that he's done are unexcusable. Oh, yeah. um, some of the things that he has done, he has been way ahead of his time. Um, he's, he's, you know, but the book that I love the best is probably one that no one has ever heard of before. And it's called Danny, the Champion of the World. And it is probably one of the most beautiful books ever written about a father-son relationship. And so I, I just love that as a, as a nation, as a world, we're reading. Yeah. Yeah, and sure. what's great about Harry Potter is it is a text that everyone at least knows of if they don't know all the details of it. 
And so to have a common piece of literature that, you know, we can sit here on this podcast with two guys I've never met before, you've never met me before, and, and have a full conversation about someone like J.K. Rowling really means that literature is holding a place in our society. And it's, it's almost, and maybe this comes from my uh, previous career as an elementary school teacher, I don't care what you read as long as you read. I agree. Absolutely. And, you know, and I think my approach to what I teach uh -huh. with, uh, Sochi agrees, uh, <laughs> with, with both media and with literature is that these things are always in conversation with the society that we live in today. And so and to understand who we are, we need to be reading things that are being produced. We need to be viewing and not just passively sitting back and saying, oh, that was a great story, which you can do that. But you can also say, well, what is that story saying about who we are as a society or who we should be as a society? So I, I'm definitely not a, you know, James Joyce is the only thing one should read sort of person. I'm a bit more like, have you read Goodnight Moon? Because there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, and go the F to sleep, you know that one? Because that one's a good one too. Um, so I, I, I think in some ways, because children's literature isn't trying to be fancy, in some ways it's even giving us clearer messages. We, we don't have to look for the hidden um, although there's a lot of hidden. Children's literature is actually a very, very radical political place to exist. Yeah. Hmm. Two, two things I'll say that Danny the Champion of the World is a fantastic book. My my oh. mom was, is or was a, um, she taught elementary school in England. So she taught five, six-year-olds. Mm -hmm. She read that every year to the kids. Oh. She, she, she loves that book. And Roald Dahl was a very complicated human being what i know of him he he had some awful views but he also he interspersed those awful views with acts of kindness to the same people he was awful to which was it was very hard to understand exactly what motivated him but uh, yeah i mean i yeah i think we we try to we try to make simple the complex in our world a bit too much yeah and I, I, I think it's a problem we see in just the debates over politics is that we're not understanding how complex views are and that one thing does not make a person this, that, or the other thing. But it, it, you know, I think that's, it's a challenge of the time we live in, in how do we have these complex conversations? And one of my colleagues uh, from Virginia just sent me an article that was written about J.K. Rowling, because of course, this will be the first time that I'm teaching Harry Potter now that J.K. Rowling's tweet comments have come out. Right. And, you know, how, how do we look at these things? And, and is the product of authors, artists, directors, is that impacted by who that author, artist, or director is? Do we throw away the work because we don't agree with the politics of the person who created the work? Sure. Yeah. yeah. It's a tough question. Yeah. It goes for music too. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Michael yeah. Jackson, he's a fantastic artist. There's some questionable things about his, uh, you know, him as a person. Yeah. How do you, how do you balance that? Yeah. So, so something you said there also, Tammy, sort of just triggers another question that I had, which is when I... So I think my sequence of events was I saw the prologue of the show and then I didn't have HBO. So I went and read the book and then I saw the show and when reading the book, I didn't have any notion that Renly might be gay. It didn't even cross my mind. I don't think now I, I'm, I'm, then I watched the show and clearly he was. And I, what I don't know is, was this something that the showrunner said, we'd really like to do this because we'd like to sort of like expand Renly's character to include this or was it just they were sort of bringing out that which they'd seen in the book? And, and then I got to thinking about myself and I was like, well, now have, having reread the book since then, I now see more of the clues because they're, they are there. But then, so a couple of questions there is, why, if, if the clues were intended to be there, why make them so oblique? Why wouldn't George Martin be more overt with those things? Secondly, what's, what's wrong with me? 
why am I, why am I failing to see that which I should see? I mean, I mean, like you said, it's good you clarified that because I was about <laughs> to pull up a list. I'd be like, McKelly, do you want to answer that? Uh... <laughs> because, because surely I should see that. I mean, is it just because I am, you know, I am my own little privileged cast, and I don't notice anything that isn't fit into that worldview? Uh, well, I obviously cannot speak for George R. R. Martin. But my first instinct in answering that question would be to go back and look at the copyright date when Game of Thrones first came out, which off the top of my head, I don't remember. I think it was 94-ish. Oh, 94-ish. Yeah. I, I can so, look. So, yeah, if, if we think in terms of the time period in which he is writing, I mean, I'm old enough now that 94 doesn't seem that long ago, but it was a long time 96. ago. And in, and in terms of, <laughs> in terms of, um, sorry, I was, just, I was like, hey, I was an elementary school teacher then. <laughs> but in, in, you know, just thinking in terms of um, how our society has become more accepting, you know, it, I, I guess kind of this question, I kind of would turn around and say, well, you know, JK Rowling has said that Dumbledore is gay. And if you go back and read with the understanding that you already know that this character is gay, then the clues make sense. But to put the clues together, I think we read with ourselves in mind when we read books. So we read for what we know. We put the clues together if we understand that positioning. Um, and I well, that was you know, Simon's stomach, by the way. Okay. <laughs> I, like, wait, wait, <laughs> I just immediately picked up a treat for her. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, yeah, it's it's hard to speak for Martin, but I guess where I would put that is that he did put clues there, and yet he doesn't blatantly say Renly's gay. But I also think that fits into Renly's character because the world in which Renly lives in doesn't accept him as being gay either mm -hmm. and so you know in season two and i i need to go back and read book two again i haven't it's been a while since i read that or i'll wait for the podcast it's coming okay. it's coming we, 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 right. <laughs> we're getting there <laughs> you know in, in season two it's very 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 clear um i think hbo brings that to light earlier than mark martin does in the series and and you know like i said i can't speak for him but I, I would guess that if Martin was writing the book today, that Renly's um, character might be a lot more out in the open. Yeah, yeah. As is, I read him as a character who is closeted yeah. because politically it is not safe. Um, it's not, you could also look at that as part of the power move that he makes to keep that part of his life secret. Yeah, sure. I don't think there's anything wrong with you that you didn't pick that up. I mean, I, I think because I watched the whole show first, I went into the book knowing right, that that's right. who Renly was. Yeah, I did as well. So it's hard for me to address it that way. But but I really do think that we often read with ourselves in mind. Yeah. And so we read through our own experiences. Yeah, that, that's what I started. As I started to formulate the question, I started to think that's it. I mean, I'm pretty much the protagonist of every book I'm reading is, is just right. me with some decoration, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I believe we were sitting at lunch one day and Simon said when I, he was about to leave and he said, when I get up and leave, you guys are just going to blink out of existence until I. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't one of my more modest days. <laughs> it's Simon's world and we all. <laughs> so, you have a class on time travel. I noticed this before we talked. I was so excited. What is your favorite time travel book? Oh my gosh. It's so hard to pick favorites. Um, Tell me a time travel book I should read then. It doesn't have to be your favorite. How funny would it be, Tammy, before you answer this, how funny would it be if she says the book that you and Joan fight over at lunch all the time? Oh, that would be fun. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> I feel like I need to get this answer right now. I don't think um, you'll say this book. So <laughs> I think I think there are all sorts of books. So I, you know, Jack Finity, Time and Again, is is a classic place to start. Uh, but I also love Wrinkle in Time, yeah. um, which I don't assign, but it's it is one of my favorites. 
I really love Kindred by Octavia Butler, hmm, okay. which which is it's a fascinating text because it's dealing with slavery and race, and and she's she's writing this in the in the seventies, but she is pulled back to uh, the past to a plantation where her white great great grandfather is first the son and then is the plantation owner. And whenever he feels threatened, he somehow has the ability to call her from the future and she has no control over this. Wow. And she has to wait until her great grandmother is conceived before she can figure out how to get rid of her great, great grandfather. So he stops Stop ruining her, her life uh-huh. from pulling her. And, and it's interesting too, because it deals with the fact of um, space and time travel, which we often don't think about. So at one point she is transported back to her time, but um, sh- her arm is in a wall. And so her arm is cut off because the space doesn't allow for the transportation. So what is there before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so um, it it deals with some really interesting things. You can't go wrong with the original time machine just because it's so crazy when you read it. Mm -hmm. I mean, from our perspective today to look back at what H.G. Wells was talking about, and uh, you know, the directions he takes the future and his hopes for the future are, are really sort of interesting. Absolutely. So, and there's so many great movies that have come out too. Um, If you haven't seen Coherence yet, um, it has to do with uh, uh, comets passing, which cause the multi-universe to align. And so it's these group of people who all the lights go out, the power's gone, but they see a house that has a light on. And so they end up trading houses, but they're from different timelines from different Ah. parallel timelines. And so um, there's, I don't want to ruin it. You just need to watch it. It's pretty fascinating. What's the the name of it again? uh, Coherence. Coherence, okay. Predestination with Ethan Hawke is the the traditional story of I am my grandfather. Right, right. And that's, it's it's really well done. So it's a fun class because again, um, I have people who, are much more intelligent about science than I am in this class. And so we're really looking at how fiction is playing with science. And of course, this idea that science fiction is not only about what we might be able to do in the future, but also the ethics. So we can do things, but should we do things? And so the project that my students work on in that course is that they have to, um, research a historical moment with sort of 20 plots, plot lines. And at some point within the first five plot lines, they have to be a time traveler and change history and have to then create what they think would result from that interference with with, uh, the original history. So it's, again, we're sort of playing with these ideas that are real science ideas. I mean, the, the, the things that you look at about what they think we can do with time travel. And yes, it's not, you know, I'm going to sit in my little time machine and push the buttons and, you know, <laughs> go 88 and, you know, leave uh, fire tracks at the mall <laughs> or anything like that. But um, it is, it is pretty fascinating to sort of look at the science side of that. One other thing I was going to ask about was as fantasy goes, at least, the Song of Ice and Fire has an unusually strong cast of female characters. And I wonder if I wonder if this is one of the reasons that it, it's better than most fantasy, honestly, because it sort of like it gives it a sort of richness that I think a lot of fantasy doesn't have because they are so sort of monogendered. I mean, it, it, it definitely I can't think of another fantasy book I've read with, with this many you know, important female characters in it. Yeah, and you know, there's been a lot of criticism about how those female characters have been treated, right. um, which, you know, again, off target, but on target. Uh, in comic books, I was just reading about this for the Iron Man article that I worked on. Um, there's a trope called woman in refrigerator. And it has to do with a comic book in which Uh, the main character came home and his girlfriend had been murdered and put in the refrigerator. 
Okay. And so it's this idea that oftentimes women are used as plot devices so that men can um, be empowered, men can go to war, men can do all these things. And if you think back to the number one female character who we never actually meet, which is Ned's sister, right? right? She's the reason Robert goes to war. Mm. I'm trying not to give away spoilers, <laughs> but, but you know, Robert doesn't quite get the story right. 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 Robert has an idea of what their relationship is and it's not what it is. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, right. You know, you could look at uh, even Kat's character, the fact that she was to marry Ned's brother, Ned's brother gets murdered. Okay. I'll just marry the next guy in line. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, you know, these, these women are present. And, and so I applaud Martin for putting them there, but I kind of like how he writes women though, too. So, right, right. I mean, I, Cersei as a female character has incredible agency and she is working within the parameters that she's allowed to have power in. Um, and, and again, if, if we're talking about how power is used, Cersei is very effective in her use of power, mm -hmm. especially in book one, she's able to manipulate and, and get her way in many things. But again, I think if we look back at history and of course, this is always the big debate, right? Like, is he really talking about the middle ages? Like where, when is Martin's story set? Right. Because we get those hints of the, the time in the past, right? It's definitely not the present, but it's sometime, some other time. Right. And if we go back and we look at the place of women in society during sort of the kings and the queens and the, and the fighting for land and position, there wasn't a whole lot of agency that was granted to right. them. The, the strong women were there because they figured out how to use power to their advantage you know simon you've got some queens in your former country's history right, right. you right. know and you think about um how even uh queen victoria still had to play the game that albert could never be king because that would somehow lessen her power mm -hmm. because she was a woman right right, right. so yeah, I think, I think Martin does a really interesting job with his women, because again, the other thing, and, and this is where you get into the politics of how we read literature, if you make the women all powerful, like we would like to see women, then you're not necessarily being truthful to the time period in which you're writing. Sure. Yeah. Which, of course, George Martin's not writing in a specific time right. period, so maybe that's just a cop out. I don't know. But, but I do think it it says something that he has women present. Yeah. yeah. Um. And sorry, I was going to give away a spoiler again. This yeah. is really hard. How do you guys do it this is? all the time? You'd be amazed how much uh, hits the cutting room floor. I have a secret. I don't remember the uh, stuff that's coming. <laughs> yeah. yeah. McKelly already filled me in on that. <laughs> but. I, I think Kat's character, the difference between the show and the book is, is an example of where Martin is writing a much stronger female than I think the HBO show gives her credit for. Mm, okay. I think, I think the HBO show also, and, and this comes up in book one, she is much more politically astute in her comments about why Ned should or shouldn't be down at King's Landing. And, and they switched that around in the HBO series. They did. They absolutely right, did. Yes. She, right. In book one, she doesn't want him to, now am I, if I remember the direction right, right? That she doesn't want him to go. In um, the book, she in, wanted him to go. In the TV yes. show, she didn't want him to go. Yes. And, and I think that discredits her because as the eldest woman of a very important family, the Tullys, um, she would be trained in those sort of political aspects right. and to sort sure. of just say, no, all she did was knit and cross stitch and, and all those things that Sansa's really good at. I, I think it would behoove fathers to train their daughters in those political ways because those marriages meant something. Yeah, sure. Now, so I don't know if that answers. Oh yeah, question. beautiful. That was great. 
So speaking of characters, I know you've said that you have a favorite character overall throughout the, the series. I won't give away who that is because I don't want to give away that character's existence over the length of the series. But j- just through a Game of Thrones, do you have a favorite character through that book one? Yeah, and I, and I think this partly comes from, again, my background in children's literature. I, I'm always looking, you know, Simon, your question was about women. I'm always looking at how children are treated. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, whether they're pushed out windows or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, Arya is just an amazing character. Oh yeah, I agree. Um, you know, the the way that she copes in whatever situation she's in, and we see that in book one, right? I think my favorite part, and I think HBO did a great job of showing this too, is the conversation between Ned and Arya, where Ned says, uh, they're talking about Bran. Bran has just woken up. And he says, oh, you know, Bran wanted to be a knight. And Ned says, well, he can still do X, Y, and Z. And says something along the lines of to Arya, uh, you know, you'll you'll marry well and you'll have lots of children. And she just looks at him and she says, that's not me. Uh, Yeah, that's That's Sansa. (laughs) That's not me. And, And I think, first of all, her... She is courageous in ways that we do not give her credit for, I think. The the fact that she is able to have such a frank conversation with her father, mm-hmm. I, th- I think is, so she's agreeing with me, <laughs> <laughs> is, is pretty amazing. I mean, I can't imagine Sansa sitting down with Ned and saying, but dad, logically, what I want to tell you is that I do think Joffrey is a perfect match for me. No, she's like, what? Right? Yeah. Um, Which I think is underscored in the series, in the HBO series, when um, Ned gives her the doll and she's like, I haven't played with dolls for years. Right? So that disconnect. So I I think Arya is able to maintain relationships. She is able to realize the skills she needs in the world that she lives in. And it is not the cross stitch that we see her attempting to do in the opening scene, right? Yeah. Right. It's yeah. it's the fact that she understands that at some point she only has herself to depend upon. And so she's interested in ways that she can do that. So I, I just think that, you know, and again, don't want to get into spoilers, but Arya to me... She's kind of the person all of the characters needed to be. In some ways, I guess Cersei is probably the only character that comes close to understanding the world she lives in and developing the skills that fit the world that she's in. Not the fantasy world that Sansa lives in, Mm -hmm. not the uber privileged world that the males in Martin's series live in, Mm -hmm. because even John as the bastard son is able to do more things than Arya is allowed to do as a female. Yeah, right. So I think the fact that we see her finding ways to learn what she's interested in is a courageous act that we don't really think about. And I think that pursuit of knowledge, whatever that means in terms of, um, you know, calling it your dancing master or right. you know, yeah. playing the game of saying like, oh yeah, I'm taking dancing lessons. You know, which Sansa never clues into. Like Sansa's like, oh, she's with her dancing master again. And she gets all these bruises, right? I was like, Sansa, clue in, you know, be observant. And that's the other thing is that um, she's observant. And so when she is able to feed herself, defend herself, when she is no longer being protected because her father is now in prison. Right. To me, that just shows so much about who Ari is. Oh yeah. Very well said. I yeah. agree with everything you said. So Well, you can disagree. You're allowed. You're allowed. <laughs> no, I, I I think Aria is an incredibly dynamic character. I absolutely agree. Do you so um slightly switching topics, but you were saying earlier at the beginning of the uh, of our discussion that you know, you're often like oh, but but <laughs> during our episodes is there is there Anything you could think of that 
is some of those butt butts. But, but why do you need to rake these coals, McKinley? <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm always wondering when we're debating, you know, because we don't claim to be experts on this. Uh, on well, this. We, we, we can claim away. No one's going <laughs> <laughs> right. to. So I often wonder, are people thinking like, no, I've, this is why this is done, dummies? <laughs> No, I, I think one of the things that I love about the podcast is that you guys have a section called pedantry where you're just like, yeah, now we're just going to pick things apart. And it's usually little things like, oh, but did you know about the walls or do you think about the rings in this way? And, and so it's, it's never like, oh my gosh, they got it wrong. It's more like, but, but have you thought about this? It's more like wanting to join in the conversation versus like saying like, oh, they got it wrong this week. You know, there's never any of that. I think you guys do a great job. Good. That's good. Good answer. I really like that answer. <laughs> well, I, I like that it's clear that you guys are, fr are your friends. Um, this is what I've been able to put together. You work together when we actually used to like go to work. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Thanks, COVID. Uh, <laughs> but that you guys are fans of the series and, mm -hmm. and you enjoy having these conversations. And I think this is, this is often a frustration for me because I'm super nerdy about these things. And yeah, I, you know, am fortunate enough to uh, have my job be this nerdy sort of thing where I can make whole classes out of this and look at it from, from an academic perspective, which is awesome but to actually just be able to sit around with your friends and like, dive into these things and go oh but did you know that i i wanted a visual of you guys doing the axis of the earth in your hands that you had last <laughs> podcast i was like what are they doing oh, i want to see yeah. that um we should, we, should do it like I, that. we should do a little video <laughs> yeah i i do think that that's one of the reasons why i enjoy the podcast is because it's kind of like i'm sitting in the room with you going hey guys did you think about this Oh, good well, so it's good you are always welcome back because this is hey. really really fascinating absolutely I, mean, I, was, I, I was really looking forward to this i mean we, we're recording this on new year's eve and it's it's getting late it's right here <laughs> in North Carolina. Uh, but this is i mean man this is so interesting to talk about and and and, and, and you elevate us so thank you so yes, much absolutely oh, I, I don't know about that i mean i think one of the things that i always tell my students you know uh because they often, I, I'm a, I'm a first generation college student and to be first gen when so many of my students are first gen, they sort of look at and they're like, how did you do that? And you're like, you know what? Every single professor you have, you have to think of them as being the Uber nerd because to go through everything you go through just to, you know, achieve an, an academic title, which honestly, in my opinion, it opens doors. It allows you to have jobs and positions that not having the title or the piece of paper might not allow you to have. But for me, you know, this is, this is what I love. I mean, I love that I found your guys' podcast because now I'm like, yes, <laughs> fellow nerds that I could talk to about this stuff. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, and <laughs> someone else may come across this podcast and go, what in the, are they talking about, right? Our families. Um, exactly. I was but, just going to say that. <laughs> I, yeah, I did listen that nobody listens to your podcast yeah. and your families. But, uh, you know, I, I just think it's, it's, it's one of the things on Facebook, someone wrote, you know, like, what is the one thing you're thankful for in 2020? And I was like, well, you know, it was, it was a tough year for everybody, but I think the fact that we have the technology that, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. you guys are where you we're all in different locations yeah. and yet we can sit, sit here and talk about things that we love and come at it from different perspectives and, and be able to have these conversations. Um, I think it's one of the things that um, I am thankful for that we have the technology and the ability to do this because it used to be really hard to find like-minded people, right? Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, it's it's <laughs> one of the reasons uh, I think I wrote this in an email that George R. Martin was the first person to ever sign up for the New York Comic Con. Right, and, yeah, you did uh, mention you that. You know, that, it, that was his first publication was his letter to Stan Lee because I also teach class on Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> all the cool you know, stuff. Like, you cover all the cool stuff. We we used to have to work so hard to find people who had shared interests. And now I think the internet has made that a lot easier. Oh yeah, absolutely has. I wanted to pick up 
Tammy's brain about, we got an email from a listener this morning and I think Simon and Tammy both, I, I wanted to get your opinions because the listener asked two questions. The, the question I have for you both is he said he has watched a TV show up to where Dance of Drag, the dance. Books okay, um, so season five. Yes, yes, exactly. He was asking, should he continue on with the TV show or should he wait for Winds of Winter to come out and then continue on the path? And my thought was by, we don't know because we don't know how Winds of Winter is going to match up with season six. I guess it would be season six, maybe some of season seven. So it's a, it's a hard question to answer. But I wanted to see if either of you had any uh, opinions on that. So another class I teach is on children's film. And in that class, we talk a lot about how adaptation is a story in and of itself. And that we see parallels between written literature and film, or in this case, TV shows, but they're not going to be the same. Right. That part, part of that is because it's a, diff, a change in medium, but part of it too is that you have different storytellers for the most part. And although Martin clearly, you know, uh, wrote a number of the episodes and was an executive producer all the way through and... Uh, to me, once we get to book five, HBO, um, they sort of take on their own storytelling. I agree. Absolutely. So I guess my opinion would be. <laughs> Keep watching. What you wanted to, well, I guess it, I guess it sort of depends. Like, did he watch the season and then he read the book or did he read the book then watch season? Right. I do uh, that's not a good know. question because if, yeah. be, because he he should try to keep going with what he's doing if that's what's you know if that's what he's getting the most pleasure from and is he happy with the changes that HBO makes as the seasons progress because you know a, a change that you make in the middle of season one is greatly amplified by the time you get to season eight right, right. yeah so if he is happy with how HBO is telling their story then I'd say keep watching yeah because. Martin is not fast. <laughs> That's an <laughs> and, understatement. <laughs> and he is getting older. There is a global pandemic. Yes. Please be safe, George R. Martin. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Lock yourself in a shack in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and right. Yeah, and right. Yes. And right. Uh, so the other question I, I actually know the answer to because he asked um, how much, uh, what is the age gap between Simon and me? And the answer is obviously what Simon is way older than I am. <laughs> so am I, am I supposed to guess this answer or <laughs> what's the question here? I, 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 don't, I don't know what the, what the gap is. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fair few years. <laughs> Stacy was shocked. She thought you and I were much closer in age than we are. Uh, yeah. Is it like seven years? Five. That's fine. It's, only, it's, fine. it's only five. Yeah. You know, you know, like <laughs> once I turned 30, just like everybody was between 27 and 35. <laughs> like, yeah. We were on the even now that I'm way past 30. Like, <laughs> everyone, I don't know. Are you like, I don't know, 32? We're on the upper end of the 27 to 35 scale. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I blew past that scale a while ago. So <laughs> well, this is this has been wonderful, Tommy. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah, this has been great fun, guys. I really do appreciate what you guys do. And I, I know that it takes a lot of work. I know how much time I put in prepping for, you know, lectures and things like that. And I know you guys are just having conversations, but it's clear that you guys are putting in the time and the effort and you always, you know, bring up something. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's, uh, that's... All of the informations of, of the really rare houses, I'm like, where are they getting them? <laughs> Just making it up as we go access along. To those things, yeah. <laughs> Most of the stuff comes from either a World of Ice and Fire or the uh, the, the Wiki of Ice and Fire. Is that what it's called? Well, it oh, comes called from the, world? the Wiki, the book. Oh, the book, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a World of Ice and Fire or Fire and Blood. And sometimes from the Dunkin' Egg stuff. But we get a lot of info from mm -hmm. a wiki of Ice and Fire, which kind of brings everything together for you in yeah. one easy location. So there you go. Yeah, great. Well, keep up the good work. And uh, well, thank yeah, this was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. 
Yeah, I, I had a great time. Thank you very much for, for spending your New Year's Eve with us. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Tammy. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Happy Tammy. New Year to you and to all the listeners. You yes, too. absolutely. Let's, let's hope that 2021 is a, is a much improved version. I will second that. Yeah. Uh, so that was so much fun. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Yep. Thanks for listening. And hey, next week we start with Clash of Kings. So get ready for that exciting times. Okay, bye. Bye.